for joining us. We're going to give it a minute or two and let people get logged in before we officially uh, get started. Uh, and if people want to go ahead and, and uh, just so you know, we do have the Q&A boxes are open as well as the chat. So you can, we'll be trying to engage with everyone uh, throughout the evening in addition to the the featured conversation. So, got a few more people coming in. So while we wait, I'll go ahead and just start uh, an introduction. Uh, so my name is Esther Peters and I'm the Associate Director at the Center for East European and Russian Eurasian Studies, more commonly known as CERES. And we're excited to welcome everyone to our first virtual series of voices with Nina Jankovic and Konstantin Sonin. Uh, with the seminary co-op, we launched this author-centered series of readings and conversations on books from or about Central and Eastern Europe, Russia, Central Eurasia, and the Caucasus in January of 2017. So we're about to start our fourth year soon. Um, and while we miss gathering together in the bookstore. The seminary co-op is still fulfilling orders through their website, hint, 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 um, uh, semcoop.com. When you place your order, you can choose from shipping, delivery to local area codes, or curbside pickup. Uh, also at their website, you can check out a full lineup of, of virtual events that they are providing uh, sales support, book sales support for as well. Some books uh, that you might be interested in our series that are coming up in November. Miriam Udell will be discussing her new collection of Yiddish sh short stories called Honey on the Page. Uh, that'll be November 19th, December 8th. Uh, Francine Hirsch will be discussing her new book, uh, Soviet Judgment at Nuremberg, A New History of the International Military Tribunal After World War II. And on February 18th, Dominique kirshner ryle will be discussing the Fiume crisis, life in the wake of the Habsburg Empire. Uh, so we're excited to kind of continue our, our robust and kind of diverse books that we feature as a part of series of voices. A few other logistical events, uh, events details uh, to, to go over. Uh, we do have up to 10 copies of this evening's book, uh, featured book to give to those who are interested. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat box and let us know that, that you'd be interested in being considered. Uh, we'll be uh, doing a kind of random drawing, so to speak, virtual version of that. Uh, and we'll let people know uh, both either via chat or via email uh, who was selected for those books and get you connected so that we get those. And the bookstore will be, uh, the seminary co-op will be providing those in addition to series. Um, we are going to have time for questions. Uh, and as, uh, so we will be using the Q&A box that you can see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please use that. Put your questions there at any time a question occurs to you. Put it in the Q&A box. We've opened the feature for you to be able to upvote. Uh, so if you see an interesting question, if that was the question you wanted to ask, go ahead and you can just upvote it. And we'll try and get to uh, as many of the most uh, engaged questions as we can. So thanks for bearing with those kind of details. Uh, and now we can kind of turn our focus to the real reason we've all gathered here this evening, uh, which is to be discussing Nina Jankovic's recently published book, How to Lose the Information War. Uh, Nina is a Washington DC based writer and analyst with a focus on Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. She is currently a global fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, uh, Kenyon Institute, and previously she served as a Fulbright Clinton Public Policy Fellow, a role in which she provided strategic communications guidance to the Ukrainian Foreign Ministry, and her writing has been published by the New York Times and the Washington Post, amongst others. How to Lose the Information War takes the reader on a journey through five Western governments' responses to Russian information warfare tactics, all of which have failed. 
She journeys into the campaign, uh, to the campaign's Russian operatives run and shows how we can better understand the motivations behind these attacks and how to beat them. Above all, this book shows what is at stake, the future of civil discourse and democracy and the value of truth itself. She'll be joined this evening in conversation by Konstantin Sonin, the John Dewey Distinguished Service Professor at the University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy. His research interests include political economics, development and economic theory. His papers have been published in leading academic journals and in economics and political science. And so now I will turn it over to the two of you. Um, thank you. Thank you, Esther. Um, welcome, uh, welcome, Nina, to University of Chicago campus, um, or e even if virtually. Um, I, I wanted to start with a question. Before I started to read your book as a, a academics and as an academics who worked uh, on information uh, operations, I read it as a Russian uh, Russian citizen and even a part-time employment. Employ, uh, employee of a state uh, of a Russian state university. Um, I mean, did Russia actually win? I mean, after so many years of lo losing like Cold War, then losing technological competition, then losing everything else. So finally, we had we had a win, really. <laughs> well, I think I think that's a an interesting framing and one uh, that I haven't frankly gotten asked before. So congratulations for that. I, I think it's a great question. And yeah, I actually do think this is one of the things that Russia is extraordinarily skilled at. And you know why I think that is. And this is coming from somebody. I want to be clear to everyone who's watching that I love Russia. Uh, I I love the Russian people. I love Russian culture, Russian literature, and I loved the time that I spent in Russia. It was one of the single most influential times of my life. And I think Russia understands the human condition in a way that you know our national security structures don't often get at. And one big misconception in disinformation and fake news, which by the way, I didn't want to have the word fake news in my subtitle of my book, but the publisher insisted because most readers think of it that way, right? I think a big misconception is that quote unquote fake news is cut and dry fake, but actually what it does is play on the humanity of people. It plays on our emotions. It plays on uh, our real grievances in society. And I think Russia has gotten very good at identifying those grievances and amplifying them. Another big conception is that, you know, Russia creates this stuff. That's not the case. Uh, that that gives Russia too much credit, but it is very good at identifying them and playing them up. And the other, you know, big advantage that, that Russia has had is that there was a lot of hubris within, especially the United States, but within the wider West, within old Europe, about, quote unquote, the end of history or the end of the Cold War, this new era that we were entering in. Uh, that didn't make room for Russia, I think. And I think that's one of the reasons that we were caught so off guard by these asymmetrical operations that Russia has been engaged in. And I think, frankly, they've been very successful. You know, I identify the goals uh, of these operations by three factors. One um, is, frankly, to, to undermine democracy in, in the West, to keep us more absorbed in our own problems um, so that we're paying a little bit less attention to the things that Russia is doing, perhaps that we would wish Russia did not do. Uh, thinking about Ukraine in particular when I say that. So that's number one. When we're busy with our own problems, we're not going to get engaged abroad. And I think that's been very true over the past couple months here in the States. The, the second one is a, a more domestic goal for Putin, which I think is when democracy in the West is failing, it gives him a rhetorical device to use with protesters and, and folks demanding democracy, let's say in Habarovsk, as we've seen all summer, and to say, How's democracy going over there in the States? Things aren't going so well. Look at how they're treating their journalists. Look at how they're treating you know, protesters there. Is that really what you want? And I think that works particularly well for him. And we've seen Russian media in particular use that rhetorical device over the past couple of months. And then the third thing is, is this asymmetrical warfare, right? By uh, inserting Russia into the worldwide dialogue by saying Russia is really good at information warfare, uh, Russia's 
earning itself a seat at the global negotiating table that uh, unfortunately, I think it got shouldered out of over the past couple of, of decades since the end of the Cold War. Um, and I think that's been remarkably successful, particularly since it took us in the West so long to, to wake up to these tactics. So absolutely, I think Russia has been successful and, and right now is winning this war. Um, I, I want to ask a question, a question about this. And you know, at the University of Chicago, we do not do trigger warnings. We just ask harsh, harsh questions. <laughs> and like, and I didn't find uh, an, a good answer in, in your book. Like in your book, Putin and people around him, they are sort of very sophisticated. They know, they know how to play the game. They actually play a kind of a complicated game, a sort of chess with their own people, with Americans. But I, 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 I met Putin in a big meeting, I met a lot of his associates, even close associates, I know people, and there is not much sophistication about them. Typically, when we read an exposure of uh, security services operation, it's mind-boggling how bad they are. I mean, you know, when they try to poison someone in Britain, eventually they uh, exposed almost 300 of Secret Service agents in Moscow just because they had the cab, uh, cab receipt with the address of the building where a lot of these people received their apartments. I mean, like, how could they win if they are so inept in everything that they do? So I think that's a really good point. And again, another big misconception about the way that Russian information warfare has been written about. I wouldn't agree that I portray it as sophisticated necessarily. And I think in the book, I even use the term, uh, it's, it's a little bit more like throwing spaghetti at the wall. Right. But it has identified a means to which it can at least influence the conversation. We can talk about behavior later, which I'm sure we will. Um, but social media allows anybody, Russia or elsewhere, to, to really test these messages over time and you don't need to be an evil genius to do it. And I, I don't think that Putin is necessarily sitting there saying, you know, these are the, the narratives you're going to use, these are the tools that you're going to use. I think the tools are just there and we can test narratives over time, no matter where we're sitting, whether that's in the internet research agency or, or anywhere else. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean need to be sophisticated. Um, disinformation has become democratized because of the tools of social media where you can test these, these narratives to a very fine degree and target them at exactly the narrative, at the, ex sorry, exactly the audiences that are going to be most vulnerable to them. Um, and so that's where I think, again, there's been this misconception. A, a lot of Americans thought and have this image, frankly, of you know, either the troll factory or the Russian security services sitting there and plotting out uh, this multi-million point plan about how this is going to go. And it's much more just like throwing pasta at the wall, seeing what sticks, and then continuing to throw that same piece of pasta at the wall over and over again. And that's evident when you look at the ads that were released, which frankly- are very Right. Successful. This is extremely well described in your book. I like- they actually, they tried to, I don't know, pop up, prop up the Texas secessionists. I mean, how crazy this idea is. How crazy this idea is. Why would this, um, I don't know, increase division in the American society? There is no such thing as division of the Texas secession, right? So they targeted both uh, really like salient issues and issues which, I mean, you need to be crazy to think that this issues are salient. I think it's extremely well described. Thanks. I, I mean, I do think uh, there's a really great researcher named Casey Michelle who looks at the secessionist movements around the states. And the one thing I will say for them, uh, not being an expert, but just a <laughs> kind of curious observer of them, is that they are filled with people who are very passionate about what they're doing. So they may be few, but they are very loud. And I think I'm not saying that there is no issue of Texas secession. What I'm saying that um, if you want to influence the 2016 elections, this is not non-issue in a state that does not matter. Yeah, yeah, and I don't, so this is, this is another thing, and I, I say this a lot uh, lately, especially with yesterday's news that 
Microsoft and Cybercom in the MS NSA were targeting a Russian hacking group uh, ahead of the election in fears that it might affect the vote count or, uh, you know, attack voting systems and infrastructure. We think of elections as the end point to disinformation campaigns, but actually it's just an inflection point. So again, I don't, I don't necessarily see the Russian strategy, even though this is what the intelligence community says, you know, they're trying to elect Donald Trump, perhaps, but I think it's more about adding chaos to the system. And if, you know, there are these chaotic elements um, that they can exploit, that's, you know, useful in, in some way. It's kind of like the Steve Bannon quote. He says that uh, his goal is to flood the zone with expletive um, <laughs> to make people uh, not be able to figure out what the truth is. And we've seen that tactic play out uh, in Russian disinformation, for instance, about Skripal or about MH17. Um, I think that is proving itself over and over, and it's not necessarily that targeted operation. It doesn't make sense in some ways, but in other ways, it, it kind of props up that chaotic environment that they're looking oh, for. That, that's actually sort of a big, a, a big problem because people love to hear an explanation that there is a kind of a strategic villain behind a plan. Yeah. And when you describe something which is just or organic or just... Um, decentralized then it's much difficult to to, to explain actually I, I have a kind of a related qu question like the last question about about Russia that like one thing that um, that sort of that sort of strange about these discussions about Russian strategy is that I think that what Putin and his his team what they try to uh, like Mm, what they try to impose, that, like the worldview that they try imp to impose on uh, uh, Western democracies, this is actually the worldview that they have themselves. So mm. it's not that they sort of privately think that American democracy is very functional and they um, do this propaganda that it's actually dysfunctional. They mm. truly believe that this is like totally dysfunctional that Russia is under siege, that there are all kinds of forces, that they're just defending the fortress Russia of all the sources. So when they talk about like Russian protests, they always think that this is just, these are just American soldiers. Yeah. Navalny is just an American soldier. So when we do something in the United States, we're just replying in kind. So I, I, I wonder like, um, like, do, do, do you see that th this thing about Putin, that what he tries to translate to the world is actually sort of what he thinks, it's not what he tries to sell? Yeah, uh, I definitely think so. I think that that has informed a lot of the rhetoric that we've seen about, uh, about the West and, and how Russia meets the West, you know, it, over the past couple of decades, if you look at uh, the color revolutions, which have recently got, gotten a lot of strange traction here in the United States. Right, right. Um, but just a moment. Color revolutions is an intellectual construct done by academics. Mm -hmm. Many of them are totally unrelated, driven by totally different factors. No, this is a plausible academic construct, but it's not a part of the physical world, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I guess I'm talking about how Putin uses the term color revolution in yeah. order to uh, to basically it's a pejorative to Putin. And I think it gets at exactly yeah. what you were just talking about, um, that he does see the world as, you know, the US, the West are constantly working against him and th through all of these ways, um, you know, fomenting protests in places as disparate as Kyrgyzstan, Georgia, and Serbia. Um, and I, I think you're right. I mean, you've, you've met the man, I have not had the privilege. So I'll, I'll check your, uh, your, your assessment of, of his character. But but I do think, you know, there's a lot of um, similarities in the way we see other leaders who have similar tendencies to Putin uh, and how they see the world. I do think it, it's not something that they, uh, that they don't actually, you know, hold those beliefs in private. They do, in order to engage that way, you have to truly believe them at heart. And I think it's hard to, to, to understand some of the decisions that Putin has made without that worldview uh, really holding meaning. Uh, now let me ask a question about uh, about um, um, Americans. So it, so we are in 2016 and 
imagine that you are in a Hillary Clinton headquarters and you read or you heard from your own people or maybe you read in newspapers that there are Russian activity in support of Donald Trump and actually if you just google like Russian trolls or something then the first thing that will pop up would be a New York Times article in 2015 about this internet research agency and troll factory. Mm -hmm. How come that the Clinton campaign was so unresponsive, so unprepared to this kind of assault? <sighs> well, I do want to make clear that I was not paid by the Clinton campaign. I was a volunteer advisor, but I have- No, I, I said, Im imagine that you are at the top <laughs> level, that you're a campaign manager. How, how could you- not understand what is going on like in in July in August I think they did um, I think they did understand especially once the uh, the hack of the DNC happened that which I believe was in June of, of 2016 mm -hmm. um, there was some alarm uh, I actually fault the US government and the Obama administration a bit more than I fault the, the Clinton campaign um, I think their messaging was actually pretty strong about what was going on. Uh, I think they understood potentially, you know, the, the effect. Um, but the situation that the Obama administration found themselves in was, was unenviable to say the least. If they made a big announcement about foreign interference in the election, uh, with the way the campaign was already going, with Trump saying he wasn't going to recognize the uh, results of the election with Trump saying uh, potentially, you know, that the Obama administration was tipping the scales for Hillary. Um, I think that could have been extremely problematic and perhaps done more harm than good. Now, that being said, do I wish there had been harsher action ahead of time? Um, absolutely. I'm not sure it would have would have changed the results, though. And I I think that now is a good time to bring up that, you know, behavior question that I alluded to before. I don't know necessarily that the, the Russian operation changed votes. What it did do, especially when we're talking about the hack and leak, was change the discussion, change, change the political discourse in America at a very critical moment. So the October surprise, the WikiLeaks hack, hack and leak, um, that changed the way that the candidates talked about themselves. It changed the, the way that the campaigns talked about each other. It changed the way the media covered the race, and you have to assume that that changed some some Americans' minds, um, or perhaps caused them to stay home. But I, it's hard for me to say definitively that that Russia changed all of that, and that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, sure, possible. sure, of course. Like Russia, if if uh, uh, if we look at the Miller report, Russia spent like ten to fifteen million dollars. The Clinton campaign uh, spent close to one billion dollars. What kind of I mean, yeah. if you could change the outcome of the elections with $10 million, then probably <laughs> Clinton campaign would do this, right? Yeah. No, but I, I think what your book makes clear is that the, uh, the understanding um, of Americans in 2016 was sort of, I don't know, maybe they, they sort of had this information, but they didn't have a clear picture. They didn't understand how large this whole uh, this whole thing is how the uh, small Russian involvement plays into a big uh, American realignment. So that's that's probably the problem. I, I'm just I just do not understand why wouldn't Clinton campaign have all these um, tracing these trolls just demonstrating that there is this kind of activity. Why wouldn't they do this? Yeah, I um, I guess. Even today, from, from what I'm aware of in various Senate and congressional campaigns, as well as the, the presidential campaigns, um, there's, they'll have one or two people on the communications staff who are tracking this sort of thing, but it's not their full-time job even now. They've all beefed up their cybersecurity, which thank goodness, because I don't think we can deal with another round of, of those sorts of hack and leaks. Um, it could still happen. There is no perfect cybersecurity ever, right? Oh, we will know in 20, 20 days. <laughs> exactly. exactly. I'm really worried about after November 3rd, seeing some sort of cyber attack after the vote has concluded, I think that could be very destabilizing. But we all know that actually, even if you have the best cybersecurity practices and the greatest cyber hygiene on the planet, it's often a human error that lets yeah. 
hackers in. Um, and so we're never going to be fully, fully staffed up, but why they couldn't, uh, you know, di more directly debunk and refute these narratives. It's just not the way that campaigns are, are functioning, frankly, and it's not the way the government functions either. I think you'll, you'll have picked up in the book that um, I, I'm concerned that governments don't think about this problem in a more proactive way in general. Um, I'm hoping that we will start to learn from, from our mistakes in the past and really create that proactive posture and the structures that we need in order to respond that way and not just be constantly putting out fires whenever something happens. Um, but we haven't gotten there yet. And um, unfortunately, you know, that means that we're, we're constantly on the back foot and we don't have this historical holistic picture of what these operations look like over the past 10 years, which is something I, I try to bring out. I think that Again, that hubris, that lack of understanding of, of recent history is what has, has really kneecapped us uh, here in the West in, in responding to this stuff. Would you praise a new Western government for their, uh, for their responses? I, I, don't know, for, I know nothing about like the German security services or German intelligence responses, but it seems that the Ger German Chancellor Angela Merkel, she sort of sees through Putin and actually through Donald Trump as well. She <laughs> kind of understands, she, she doesn't always react to anything what they say, but she always looks as if she understands what is going on. So I wonder if there is positive experience that can be, can be used by others. Yeah, I think Germany uh, has a slightly more holistic view of this problem and they don't just view it as a national security problem. They're investing in things like media literacy, for instance, which I think is extremely important because as I said, these aren't just things that Russia is doing to us. Uh, it's exploiting fissures that already exist in our society. So training people to kind of feel out that emotional manipulation is really important and Germany does some of that. They've also got a really robust media environment in Germany, um, something that I think a lot of the less resilient nations, if we look at Ukraine, even the United States, uh, we don't have that same robust consumption of media of all stripes, particularly local media. And I think that that leaves a vacuum for disinformers, whether they're from Russia or here in the United States, plenty of political fringe outlets um, that are taking advantage of that vacuum in the local media space, especially. Um, I, I view that as a big vulnerability. And then Germany's also taken, and, and this is where I get a little bit, uh, a bit more tentative about the German response. They've taken some legislative action against uh, disinformation on social media as well with, through the Netz DG law, which requires that platforms take any content that goes against German law down within 24 hours of it being reported to the platforms. And this, I think, has gotten it a little bit into the realm of censorship for me. I would like to see just more oversight and transparency of the platforms rather than give them the keys to quash speech, basically. Because when they do that, we see, frankly, minorities uh, are affected more than, uh, than the majority in most countries. We, we see their speech taken down, mostly because it's done with AI and AI has trouble uh, reading the posts of, of minority groups very often. So that's a little bit troubling. I would also say that Estonia has done a decent job with this stuff, uh, thanks to you know, the benefit of hindsight in, in part, um, also because they have a smaller, more nimble, more nimble government uh, to deal with. You know, when you only have 1.3 million people, it's a bit easier to, to wrap your arms around such a large problem. Um, Estonia really has approached things holistically. They have stronger cyber defenses. The NATO uh, Cyber Center of Excellence is in Tallinn. Um, also, of course, you know, the Estonian government is all uh, done through e-governance. They have really robust security practices in place uh, so that if they were to get hacked, there are plenty of copies of their data and firewalls up. But they've also invested in their people, understanding that the Russian minority in Estonia, uh, ethnic Russians and also Russian speakers. There are plenty of people who, who speak Russian there who, who don't speak Estonian and are kind of lumped in with the, the ethnic Russian community, um, that they have real grievances against the government. Uh, they don't have the same job opportunities. They don't have the same educational opportunities. They are in fact de facto segregated in different um, you know, parts of Tallinn and, and regions in the country like Narva. Um, and so the government has started to invest in those educational and career opportunities, invest in integration, 
really reach out from the federal, well, not from the federal level, they don't have a federal government, but from the, the uh, national level rather, um, to the ethnic Russian community and say, you know, we see you. They've even moved government ministries there for uh, sabbaticals during the year to Narva um, to really, you know, have listening sessions and understand the, the problems and the grievances of that community. And I think that really matters. And then on top of that, they've in invested in kind of the common sense sort of things like uh, Russian language media, which of course was a huge vector of influence prior to that being created. And it's, it's difficult, you know, people aren't going to trust government Russian language media just because it pops up, but they recognize that it's a generational problem. Um, and I think that's something that we, we lack here in the United States as well. Everyone wants this to be done yesterday. And we don't realize that not only Russia, but domestic adversaries as well, domestic disinformers have been working at this for many, many years. And it's going to take a long time to repair our information environment. Right. Okay. So we, we stopped in Germany and Estonia. Could we uh, go to the midpoint to Pol Poland? Poland yeah. is also like Estonia. It's a former part of greater uh, of greater Russia with special relations in 20th, 20th century. So um, like one strange thing is that in Poland, there is a party, a ruling party, which um, in many respects have the same worldview and sell the same thing as Putin. But these people, uh, they were actually not prominent, but they were anti-communist in Soviet, Soviet years. Yeah. But back 40 years ago, like their provenance, their origin is like completely anti-Putin. Mm -hmm. They're like the opposite. Yeah, they were at the round table. I cannot <laughs> imagine actually a Polish party which would be like pro-Russian. Like there is no pro-Russia lobby in um, in, in Poland, but still they're sort of like Putin's soulmates. So that is, maybe there is something about Putin which is not actually Russian. Maybe that's something that just Russia caught first and then other countries are catching the same cold. Right. Yeah, I think they're, they're, I don't know if I would necessarily call it populism. I would defer to you on that, Constantine. But there, there's definitely a, uh, a shared spirit that certainly uh, the Russian government is taking advantage of with the law and justice government and uh, Yaroslav Kaczynski, who's now finally in a ministerial position after a very long time kind of being in the shadows. Um, the, the Poland chapter was, was hard for me to write because I am a Polish American and I've seen, uh, I've really worried about the kind of degradation of, of democracy in Poland over the past five or six years since the law and justice government came into power um, and the ways in which their, their governance decisions have have basically opened the door to, to greater Russian influence as you've alluded to. Um, you know, things like taking over the state broadcaster and making it a mouthpiece of the government. Uh, judicial independence, of course, hugely important. Uh, one of the main things that the Law and Justice Party campaigns on is their economic uh, outreach to the middle and lower classes. So paying 500 zloty to uh, families that have, for each of the uh, children that they have, um, things like that make them extremely popular, but rhetorically, uh, they leave the door open for a lot of the anti-Western uh, narratives that we see starting potentially in the Russian ecosystem, um, but sometimes just, just being 100% uh, born and bred in Poland, which is a very similar situation to what we're hearing, seeing here in the States today. Um, one of the main conclusions of the book is that, you know, you can't fight foreign disinformation when you are using disinformation on your own people. And that is something that the Law and Justice Party has done. There are several studies and investigations which have uncovered troll and bot farms that they're using. And so you look at their national security doctrine and it's very clear, you know, we are going to, we're going to counter Russian aggression, we're going to stand up for Ukraine, we're going to counter Russian disinformation in Poland. And in fact, Poles will tell you we're inoculated to Russian propaganda. We don't, we know what's going on. You don't have to tell us, we, we're very aware. But 
Then you see things like their minister of digitalization worrying a lot about, quote, anti-conservative bias on social media. Again, this should sound very familiar to our American listeners here. Uh, without looking in the mirror and understanding that his own party is using the same tactics that they're pushing back against when it's coming from Russia on their own people. It's, it's a very pot calling the kettle black situation. And it just leaves us more vulnerable, uh, no matter what country it's happening in. Poland, Georgia has a similar situation. We certainly have it here in the United States, where when we have this kind of duality of how we approach disinformation, foreign, bad, domestic, we're going to turn a blind eye to it, uh, that makes it impossible to counter any of this stuff. And that's what we're seeing really playing out in this election here in the United States. Just yesterday, Facebook uh, finally updated its policy to say you cannot deny the Holocaust on, on Facebook. Uh, many people are saying, why did it take so long, right? Um, and it's because of those very issues that we treat foreign and domestic disinformation differently when they are really two sides of the same coin. They help each other and they both are a detriment to democracy. Um, I, I have not realized that you uh, have any connection to, to, to Poland. Uh, so, so, sorry, but, uh, and I'm, I'm pretty fine if you think that Russia was a part of greater Poland uh, in old days. That's, that's fine with me. So, so uh, but is Donald Trump popular in Poland? Yes, I think so. Um, I do think so. Like, and I think let, let me, could, it, it was, let, let me follow, follow up on this. Because in, in Russia, Donald Trump is extremely popular. He is extremely popular among Russia and the United States. You cannot believe how popular he mm -hmm. is. Ronald Reagan was as popular as Trump, but no politician uh, in between. Um, and he's popular in Russia. But it, it's like mind boggling. Russians do not like the United States, they think United States uh, are imperial. Donald Trump is an American nationalist. He's America first. He, is, um, he thinks that the world screws up the United States and people still love him. So that's, it's completely rational, but that's kind, of, that's kind of the fact. So I wonder what, is that the same thing in Poland? I don't think it's for the same reasons. I think, and I would love to hear your opinion on this. Uh, I think the way that Putin and Trump have, have kind of hit it off um, is probably something that is appealing to some Russian, that, that Trump treats Putin with respect, um, which it's been a while, maybe since Bush, uh, that that's happened. Obama certainly did not. Um, and in Poland, I think it's a little more transactional. So they're, they're willing to look askance at the fact that Trump undermines NATO and that Trump has a friendship with Putin. Uh, but they're very happy that Trump delivered on the visa waiver program, finally, after years and years of promises about that. And they're happy about Trump's military investments in Poland and Trump's praise of Poland for meeting its uh, NATO defense spending targets. So I think it's a, a little bit more transactional, even when... By, by the way, I do not know, I, we, we certainly know how Donald Trump thinks about Putin because he tweets about this, he talks about this. I do not know much about President Putin attitude sure. because President Putin, uh, he's famous for his hatred, not love. So we know that sometimes he starts to hate a person like Barack Obama, uh, then Hillary Clinton, mm -hmm. but I never... I never like heard him speaking lovingly of, or like acting as if he would admire a foreign leader. He's yeah, he's not like into this. Well, I still think the the narrative that's presented of Putin and Trump, the fact that they had this you know press conference in Helsinki, the fact that we have these uh, breathless reports about their their sidebars at different you know international conferences, that at least pr presents the the narrative that they have a working relationship at least i don't think i agree we'll never hear putin say like donald trump is a is a great guy um, <laughs> but uh but they you know that working relationship is important um of course you know uh polish president duda came to uh the states just before the polish election um geez what month was that june it's hard to remember 
Um, that was a very strange visit for uh, a number of reasons and disruptive of, of our foreign policy protocol um, in general. We wouldn't have a foreign leader who's up for election in several days uh, here for a state visit, but it's what the Trump administration decided to do. And again, I think that was a, a narrative win for the Law and Justice Party. Um, and I think, again, that, that transactional relationship, uh, there's also been some, I think, an LNG gas deal between the US and Poland since June. So all of that's, uh, that's important. And I think that's why we see some love for Trump in Poland as well. It'll be interesting to see how the Polish American vote uh, breaks up in, in this election. Uh, last election, of course, the Polish American community really went, went hard for, for Trump. Um, and R really, because he in Illinois, there were no like, um, the, the, there was support for Trump, but there was no like wave of support. What what I see in the Russian community in the United States, it it's sort of it's sort of amazing. Really? Yeah, it's it's something something completely uh, completely unusual. But I wonder, uh, like, going back to the elections and the issue at hand, do you think that the like world um, dictators or strongman love for Donald Trump would survive his loss in November. So I'm like, Donald Trump has a chance to be an extremely usual American former president, because I think if he um, loses this election, then he will run for uh, re-election. And it's actually his to lose the primary. I mean, he will be a heavy favorite to be the next uh, Republican uh, Republican contender. Do you think that um, what is going on around him, around the world, in Russia or elsewhere, will continue uh, uh, after November 3rd? That's a good question. I, I hadn't thought about that, <laughs> frankly. Um, I do think the love that he has from many of these strong men uh, is, is certainly unprecedented. You know, we saw also Viktor Orban uh, endorse Trump and uh, I think just a couple weeks ago. I mean, the fact that so many foreign leaders are coming out to kind of express their fealty is a bit unusual. Um, and if he didn't run again for office, I think we'd see uh, something similar to what the former mayor of New York, Rudy Giuliani, has done. I think he could make a lot of money doing political consulting um, in, you know, for strong men in places like Ukraine, for instance, uh, just using Ukraine because Giuliani has worked there, so did Manafort. But, you know, places where that are still democratizing, um, where those sorts of political consultants make So a, you're imagining like a global Trump foundation with him giving lectures around the world for- I wouldn't even say a foundation. <laughs> that makes it sound like it's pro bono. I think Trump would want to make money off of such yeah. an endeavor and would probably seek to cash in on his, uh, on his campaign. Uh, yeah, I am pretty sure he will be the most successful former president, <laughs> like on the global circuit. Uh, okay, I, I wonder should we should we ask Esther and participants to ask questions? Sure, Esther. Sure, we do have. Uh, excuse me, we do have uh, one question at least that came into the Q and A box. Um, and maybe we can we can start there. And I think one has come into the, the chat box. But the first one that came into Q&A was, uh, do you think that the Russians have an influence on the current situation in North Korea? Whew. <laughs> I don't know if I can answer that one. I don't know much about North Korea. Uh, Constantine, why don't I throw that over to you? <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I think Russia uh, has some influence on North Korea, but not uh, not that much. The thing is that Russia actually has a kind of, um, I mean, Russia doesn't invent new things in diplomacy, it does what the Soviet predecessors do. So mm -hmm. they sort of supports whatever, uh, whoever ha has power in North Korea and is just like, just like conservative preservation. That makes sense to me. <laughs> Again, I really know very little about North Korea, um, but I would say, you know, Russia, like any other country, has interests all over the world. So I would be surprised if they uh, didn't, you know, 
at least have a strategy for North Korea. Not well, actually, um, actually, Russia, I think, has a common border with North Korea. Certainly, I mean, Russia, in fact, should be much be more worried about North Korea nuclear weapons than um, than the United States because we're so close. Uh, well, the next question is maybe uh, close to, to something we talked about in June when, when you know, joined us for an educator event. Uh, do you think we should stop using the term fake news? This is from, from Ken. He's wondering about the implications of continuing to use the concept in everyday conversation. Yeah, um, I think we need to be very precise when we choose our terms about, about disinformation and influence operations writ large. And something that I really try to do when I'm uh, doing media is to make sure to correct reporters in particular when they misuse terms. So um, for anybody out there who might not know, this is at least how I define these terms. And there is a little bit of daylight in between my definitions and some of the other experts. But disinformation is the use of false or misleading information with malign intent. Misinformation is the use of false or misleading information without malign intent. So that's your aunt or uncle at the Thanksgiving dinner table who likes to traffic in conspiracy theories. They're, they don't have malign intent. Um, fake news has really lost a lot of its meaning. Uh, one of the first organizations to start using the term fake news was Stop Fake News in Ukraine. And they're a debunking and fact checking outfit. Um, and you know, I think it was a catchy, catchy term, catchy title, but then we saw a lot of, a lot of politicians in, in various contexts, uh, including Trump, including Bolsonaro in Brazil, Orban in Hungary, uh, Duterte in the Philippines, using the term fake news as a pejorative in order to uh, describe coverage that was politically inconvenient for them. And in that way, I think it's really lost, lost meaning, but also um, hearkening back to what I said at the beginning of the conversation, which is that disinformation and the most successful disinformation often is not just a cut and dry fake. It's not just a bad Photoshop. It's not just a completely made up article. It's stuff that speaks to you. So one of the things that I'm trying to get everybody to do, especially ahead of the election, or I, I should say during this election season, because we're all voting right now, is if you feel yourself getting emotional when you're consuming a piece of content, that's a good indication that you're being manipulated. So just take a step back, practice informational distancing, put yourself, you know, some distance between you and your computer or your device, go for a little walk, breathe. And if you still find yourself thinking about that piece of content that you consumed, go back with a cool head and try to do some cross-checking. So is another outlet reporting what you've just read? Uh, if you copy and paste some of the text, where does it take you? There's a lot of things going on around on Facebook today, and not just today, like actually today, but today in the metaphorical sense, that are, um, are copied and pasted or taking, taken out of context, uh, that if you do a Google search, you'll, you'll find where it, it, it like came from originally, and it's, it's not what it said. There, there was one quote in particular from Dr. Fauci that was getting spread around Facebook uh, a lot, a lot in the beginning of the coronavirus crisis that was not something Dr. Fauci said. It was like vehemently political. It was very critical of the Trump administration. And this was at the time when the task force was still doing regular briefings. And so I did a little bit of a, a search when a friend of mine shared this and it turned out it was something that somebody wrote and then it got misattributed to Dr. Fauci. Um, so really important to do stuff like that. Also, I would encourage everyone to learn how to do a reverse image search um, which is one of the things that we went through in the, in the educator course, I believe. Basically, this is a great way to find the earliest instance of an image on the web. Um, if you are using a Chrome browser, you can right click and do uh, search Google for image. That's one way to do it. Actually, we're, we're with a bunch of Russianists tonight. So Yandex has a great reverse image search as well. It's actually much more powerful than Google's. Um, and that will find you not only uh, instances of that particular image, but it will find you similar instances. This is how I find pictures of myself on the web that I did not know existed. <laughs> um, so useful tool. Um, but that will help you uh, to, to understand if something has been, you know, manipulated in some cases, uh, especially Yandex will show you that, or if it's been misattributed. Here in the, in the DC area, every hurricane season, when we have a flood of the Potomac River, there's inevitably a fake picture 
of a shark swimming in the Potomac River that uh, people fall for every year. This is a great way to identify those sorts of hoaxes. So fake news, not a helpful term, but we all need to understand that this disinformation is not fake. It is playing on our emotions and we need to take the necessary precautions to slow the spread uh, and understand that we are part of that. You know, we can wait for social media companies to act more. We can wait for the government to have the political will to do it. But most disinformation is not spread through ads. It's spread organically. And it's up to us to, to put the brakes on that. That's my, my soapbox moment for the evening. <laughs> I hope it's useful to some of you. Well, I think that, yes, that's very good. I will also say that that particular event is available. Uh, if, if you are interested in more, uh, we, can, we can pass that along if people are interested in, in more details of how to recognize misinformation and dis disinformation. Um, that, that presentation is on our Educator Outreach YouTube channel. Um, so uh, we do have uh, time for, I think we have a few more questions and we do have a few more minutes. Um, so Alec is asking, I'm, uh, he's curious if you think there might be or already is a proliferation of misinformation campaigns as a means to influence or disrupt elections, especially outside the US EU, given how cost effective it can potentially be. So, um, my experience looking for disinformation outside of the US and EU structures has been particularly in Ukraine. Um, I think that's a bad <laughs> case study. Obviously, Ukraine has been hit from all sides uh, with mis and disinformation. But I will say um, that I was in Ukraine for the presidential election in 2019. In fact, that's mostly what my, my educator uh, webinar that Esther just mentioned is about. It was done in cooperation with the Pulitzer Center, which provided me a reporting grant to do some work there during that fascinating election. Um, and we were looking for a lot of uh, evidence of disinformation, not only from Russia, but uh, domestically. And I will say that the the environment in Ukraine in the 2019 election was very similar to the environment here. It was a very charged election campaign with two candidates who were, uh, you know, basically at each other's throats. Uh, the, the difference, of course, is that it was a much more active and in-person campaign because coronavirus did not exist yet. Uh, there were still accusations of drug tests and things like that, though. Um, but it was a, my point is that it was a very uh, active campaign, right? And there was a lot coming from both sides, a lot of mud being slung, and a lot of domestic disinformation in the Ukrainian information environment, some of which came from President Poroshenko's campaign. Uh, there were indications that he used a PR firm to create a guise of grassroots organizations that were attacking uh, then candidate Zelensky, and that was uncovered through Facebook's ad library, although Facebook's implementation of its other counter disinformation policies left much to be desired in that election. But my point here is that I think what we are seeing more and more of these days is a proliferation of domestic disinformation that also benefits uh, various foreign disinformers. So in a situation where the Ukrainian candidates are at each other's throats and there's a lot of rancor domestically, there's a lot less for an adversary like Russia to do. Um, in fact, you know, where there is uh, media that, you know, will take the Russian narrative, they don't need to do very much. All they need to do is is amplify what's already there. And we're seeing the same thing here in the United States today. Uh, if you look at overt Russian propaganda sites like RT and Sputnik, not that they are extremely influential, but it does allow us an, a narrative window. Um, they are absolutely parroting a lot of President Trump's claims about mail-in balloting and voter fraud. Uh, so again, this comes back to my point that foreign and domestic disinformation are two sides of the same coin. And the best antidote to foreign manipulation at an election time or, or elsewhere is to shore up the resilience of your own society in the information ecosystem, but also in terms of good governance, which is, you know, it's hard to, to deal with that because you can't legislate good governance. It just, you need to have the, the political will of your elected officials to do that. And that's one thing that I've tried to do in my work. Um, I will actually be testifying uh, in front of the House Intelligence Committee again on Thursday. I've, I've testified before. Uh, House Appropriations and, and Senate Judiciary um, to a panel of both Democrats and Republicans. And my message to them is that disinformation is not a partisan issue. It's one that really affects the very bedrock 
of the way our country operates. And we, we need that political will. We need them to set a good example uh, in order to, to get a handle on this problem. Well, I think maybe we have time. We have one last question that's come into the Q&A box. And I think we probably have just that right amount of time to answer the question. Um, and it's, it says, do you have any critical thoughts about what kind of role the marketing advertising industry has in the social sphere or what kind of role the industry could have? Yes, I do. And in fact, uh, this is bad. I'm getting, this is like shameless plug hour. Um, tonight, I think there will be dropping a podcast, Make Me Smart, uh, that Marketplace puts out. I'm going to be on with Kai Rizdahl and Molly Wood talking about those very things. Um, we taped it this afternoon. But in short, yeah, the, the public relations firms have gotten extremely involved um, in being kind of the go-between between baddies and, and the platforms to create an air of plausible deniability so that we've seen Russia do this, right? It hired a PR firm in Ghana and, and one in Nigeria, if I'm not mistaken, to do some programming toward the United States back in March. We've seen uh, Brazil do this. It's hired uh, PR firms on behalf of Bolsonaro to, and this was programming directly toward Brazilians. I mean, this stuff is happening a lot. So I, I, if there's any PR folks in the, in the audience, we need to think long and hard about the contracts that we're taking. But my, my last point would be ultimately, who benefits here? The, the PR firm gets, you know, perhaps a sizable contract politicians perhaps gain influence and power, who is making $68.7 billion a year on advertising? Facebook. Um, we've not really talked too much about social media tonight, but ultimately the platforms are always going to be looking after their economic best interests, not the de democratic best interest of our nations. And that's why we really need some regulation and oversight and transparency in this issue in this area. I'm not advocating for governments to decide what can and cannot stay up online, but I would like to make sure that the platforms are doing their best by users. And as someone who gets trolled online a lot uh, by folks here in the United States, I can tell you that those platforms are not doing their best by their users. They are not enforcing their terms of service. It is a scale problem, but they're multi-billion dollar corporations and they need to be incentivized to do that. And that's where the government should be stepping in because as it stands right now, people are getting pushed out of public life because of abuse that they receive on the internet or their opinions are getting quashed. Freedom of speech is not freedom of reach. And that's what the platforms are providing right now. Womp womp. <laughs> that's way to end <laughs> well, I think on that note, I we've got, I, uh, Thank you for everybody who's, who's kind of uh, put their name in the hat for books. I think um, pretty much if you put your name in, you've got a few minutes left before we go. I think pretty much if you put your name in, you're getting a book. Um, uh, Ken did just added a note. He asked about advertising as well. And he, he said he appreciates the freedom of speech versus freedom of reach note. Um, so uh, do either of you have any last comments before we, we've got, to, oh, I'm going to put this note. We've got two more. Oh, we've got one more, maybe book. Last, next person who puts their name in the chat gets a book um, before we go. And, and as we wait to see if anybody has any, uh, uh, wants to claim that last book, I will say, Constantine or, or Nina, do you have any last, last comments to, or thoughts to leave us with? No, thank you. This was this was extremely interesting. The book was very interesting conversation, even more so. Thank you, thank you, Constantine. It was a delight to talk to someone who asked such uh, out of the box questions. I get asked the same things a lot, and it's it's really refreshing to have such a conversation with you. So, спасибо <laughs> огромное. Well, uh, thank you. I think we've we've got. Uh, our last two books claimed, and thank you both for such an enlightening conversation. Thank you, Esther, for having us. Uh, uh, thank you all for joining us this evening for our first, uh, I think, successful virtual series of voices, and I hope you will uh, come back uh, to talk about uh, all sorts of uh, interesting uh, uh, books going on in the future. So. Uh, thank you. I hope everyone uh, stays uh, safe. And for those in the U.S., uh, goes out and uh, votes. That's I'm doing that tomorrow. So, <laughs> and I will. Uh, we'll, we'll hopefully see everyone uh, in a few weeks for Yiddish stories. So.
Thank you very much. Good night. Good night.